Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is July 30th, year 2023, 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I hope you're all doing wonderfully well today. Well, I have an uh, enormous project ahead of us today. I'm going to try to keep it under 90 minutes. And uh, I titled it Soft Apocalypse Now. And of course, for those of you who are cinema literate, and that's most of you who are regular viewers to this channel, and subscribers and Patreon people here operating at a higher contextual level. So <laughs> that's why I can play with these titles. Soft Apocalypse Now, as opposed to Apocalypse Now. We're going to talk about that film in a moment. 1979, Francis Ford Coppola. Soft Apocalypse Now and Auto Annihilation Theater. Now, so far as I know, I'm the first person, maybe the only person to have crafted um, this particular phrase, Auto Annihilation Theater. So I'm putting it into the swim of things. All right. That's what I do. I'm a wordsmith. Two people or you know, both sides can play the word magic game, right? So this is a good one. This is a good, and it's not just gratuitous. It's a, it's a, it's a concept that has utility, value. It'll also stick with you, and uh, it echoes the visual representation of what this talk hopes to be. I don't know how it's going to turn out. This is always my uh, first run. <laughs> this is my rehearsal and final performance. I don't do the uh, AI scripted uh, material that you see all the pop-up pundits. Usually they're like in the mid thirties or early, oh, maybe mid twenties, early thirties. You have all these actors, wannabe actors whose parents have bought them channels on YouTube. And you can tell that they're actors because they can't pronounce the word. They, they screw up on words, but really easy ones, not just general grammatical errors, but, but terms that, uh, it, that, that betrays their lack of knowledge on the on the topic, even the theme that they're discussing, right? So if you're one of those people who are used to watching these types of semi-automated programs that are proliferating on TubeView, then please switch out, all right? Because I don't want to hear you griping and moaning about my digressions and I just keep talking in circles. There's a method to my madness, if you will, but if you're used to like 20, 20 second uh, Joe Rogan type sound bites or Alex Jones, every commercial is for uh, every piece of content is an excuse for a commercial, right? For for some sort of supplements uh, that you probably won't benefit by because you won't live long enough. <laughs> We're getting a mixed message. We're all going to die. But the, on the other hand, why don't you buy the supplements? So if I was going to die, I wouldn't be spending my money on <laughs> on such. But that's that's just me. Not that I'm averse to it. I think because of our debased food supply, uh, we we do need supplementation. So don't get me wrong on that. Um, but that's not part of my business model. I don't have a business model. In fact, I don't even know what to call it. Right. So you're getting it for free. All you tourists, don't complain. You're, it's it's a freebie. All right. So I'm going to use this as sort of a run-up, this particular show, as a, it's a standalone, but it's going to be a compliment, let's call it, to next week's show, which happens fall to fall on August 6th. And that is the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And a couple days later, Nagasaki happened. But you're going to get a bonus show next Sunday. I'll be talking about the third nuclear attack on Japan. That's kind of left the headlines, even in the Indian news, right? Supposed to the Indian news, because most of those are kind of been clawed back into the dominant media octopus. But your third bonus one, in addition to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, will be Fukushima. And I've been to all three places. I lived just outside of Hiroshima in a little town called Saijo. Historically, it's a sake-producing 
area known for that whole area is known for its pristine water i mean there's a whole cultural history there and hiroshima i used to visit there two three times a week i was hoping i was going to live in the city but i got a fulbright fellowship at the university of hiroshima you know someone is pointing me in certain directions because because you didn't get a for the full right program you don't get a choice to where you're going i knew i was going to go to japan but they could have sent me anywhere in japan any university any college they could have sent me but they sent me to university of hiroshima uh, but by that time the humanities social science division had moved outside of hiroshima proper and the medical school was there i think the law school is still in metropolitan hiroshima but they had moved my division into an area called higashi hiroshima east hiroshima and they built a new airport out there and they're going to make into a, a a tech hub right the new media and all that um and in fact when i went there the trees had just been planted they were sprouts right if i went back now i prob probably wouldn't recognize the place because it would look mature right so i did uh, this was a 93 94 very important year for me it, it turned me around personally as well as professionally on many levels so I'll, i hope you'll indulge me next week if i also interweave personal accounts reminiscences of uh the hiroshima nagasaki and um, fukushima disasters man-made disasters because they're related. All right, so that's going to be next week. Um, I found out that uh, <laughs> this is part of the reason why I like to do this, because it forces me to learn new new material. But I found out that most of the footage that you and I, we've been watching all these years for decades now, about the supposed, supposed mushroom cloud over Hiroshima, it, that's not Hiroshima. It's not that it's faked. It's actually Nagasaki. Right, because they couldn't, those films were confiscated. This book details this, by the way. It's called Atomic Cover Up. Forget, don't forget, just have fun with it like I do. Forget Lookout Mountain. All these people, oh, yeah, Lookout Mountain. They faked all the nuclear film. Like, man, you are way behind the curve. Right. So, oh, yeah, Lookout Mountain's right by Laurel Canyon. That's where all the, uh, all the uh, David Crosby, who, by the way, his father was a pioneering cinematography, who worked with uh, Robert Flaherty, who directed Nanook of the North. And he was Academy. I think he won an Academy Award for cinematography. So he could have been involved for all I know. But that's all they focus on and say, oh, Frank Zappa. Yeah, I know Frank Zappa, his father, Frank Sr., worked for... I think he was a chemist by profession. In fact, Frank Zappa said the reason why he came down with cancer is because he was volunteered as a child to take these nasal, well, they're not suppositories. I don't know what you'd call them. Are they uh, inhalants? I don't know what the medium, but he claims that, that there's some kind of um, a viral connection. He died far too young, right? Just like a lot of people in my generation have died far too young for reasons that you've heard on the, you know, the, remember the polio scare? And that's part of the, um, it was an epi epidemic. It wasn't from polio, it was from the, guess what? Sound familiar? No, I'm, I want to stay <laughs> on YouTube, so I'm not going to go any uh, farther down that, that line there, okay? Um, and the nuclear fear theater, and the reaction to it is part of that complex, right? That's why it may seem that I'm going around in circles, but I'm doing it because they they relate to one another. So that's for next week. And I found out that not only were, were these clips that we had seen, at least if you're at my age, from, from school age to present about the devastation of uh, Hiroshima, rarely Nagasaki, it's kind of like the forgotten second city, um, but there was a um, Japanese American, Issei, first generation. He was Japanese now. I don't know if he ever became an American citizen, but he studied cinema in America, and he was he was part of the uh, uh, cinematography 
group. There are a couple of Asians, and another one was a James Wong Hao, Chinese. He was born in America. His folks were longtime Californian, you know, old time Cantonese speaking people. And there are a couple like them who are, you know, behind the scenes because if um, they can't put it in front of the scenes, for, for that to happen, they have to use Keanu Cruz, right? It can't be an Asian person. It's got to be like a Hapa, like Keanu Cruz, or it has to be Tom Cruise. Tom, Tom Cruise is the last samurai, right? <laughs> okay. So that's why these, by default, they had to perfect their trade uh, behind the camera, you know. Justin Lin, you know. He had the skills, but he was he didn't fit the profile. He was not a black man who you have to see in the NBA. You know, they said, you don't belong in the NBA. You belong in the National Badminton Association, not the National Basketball Association. So he's out in Taiwan playing professional ball. He's still active. Comes out of Harvard, too. That was another strike. But it's mostly because he was Asian. Uh, and then there was the big, all this excuse of the supposed experts saying, oh, yeah, Stephen Fulton's going to whoop that hype job that uh, Inui, which is not how you pronounce it, it's called Inoue. Yaoya, Inoue. And then there was some Puerto Rican punk who was pushing his dad. His dad was, is, was a professional boxer. That guy was taking his life in his own hands. When he did that, you've seen that. So all, that's all that hype there. And the reason I mention that is because when when Inoue cleaned the clock of one Stephen Fulton, right? You know, people all be selling the wolf ticket. You know, wolf ticket. Woo, 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 woo. Okay. There are forces out there that are trying to kill people of African descent. And you're so invested in professional sport, you're invested in Kobe Bryant or whoever else, or, or LeBron James. I'm saying there's more important issues that regard your people in the human race by extension, and that's annihilation, bio-annihilation, all right? And that's one of the reasons why they got you fixated on professional sports or whatever else you think you have a monopoly in, you know, gangsterism or hip-hop or rap. I already told you before, there would be no rap or hip hop if it wasn't for Japanese electronics. You feel me? You should feel me, because unlike you black bourgeoisies, I grew up in the hood under segregation with my brown, my black, and my yellow brothers and sisters. You dig? In Los Angeles, under segregation during the 50s. So all you people teach in these civil rights organizations, whether it's Mecha or La Raza or BLM or Antifa, you are all the bourgeoisie people. And same with you Asian bourgeoisies. Okay? You're in the same group. That's why you over-identify with these groups, because you didn't live amongst them and realize they're just human beings trying to get over. All right. So I'm, the reason I'm going on this digression, because there's definitely a racial component to all this when they said, oh, yeah, Fulton might have lost the fight, but we won the woe. Yeah. Which woe are you talking about? You know, who's we anyway? So don't get me. So anyway, this guy, there was a guy named uh, his American name was Harry. Harry. Uh, what is it? Um, Mimura. The Japanese Akira, Mimura, right? But Harry, because he wanted to be just one of the one of the boys. He wanted to be a Harry, and he was the guy that did all the foot. And what I learned from this little book here is that the the guy in the military. I'm kind of giving you a preview here. I'm sorry, but I wasn't intending to. I don't. But I'm excited about next week already. But the the um. See, this guy was born in Ireland. He was an Irishman. <laughs> this was in the days when men were men, you know. Okay, he's a straight up, uh, straight talking, man up Irishman from Ireland. He even had a, you know, a little bit of the brogue, but he he had done it. He was an American citizen and all that. But he has, as an infant, he had, he, had, he had, his parents brought him to America, and he became the top guy in the. Um, the military unit that was responsible for going in right after the attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to film the destruction. And the main cameraman was Harry Mimura, and he gave him high praise. And also, 
Kurosawa Akira, the famed Japanese director, knew Harry Mimura too. I never knew about Harry Mimura because he's not written about in the cinema histories. For the same reason that Justin Lin couldn't make it in the NBA, and for the same reason that Steve Fulton is still the king of Philadelphia, even though a even though Inoue cleaned his clack. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to talk about realities here. We're going to talk about brute physical realities without pulling any punches. And that's what I like about sports, especially individual sports, is that you can't BS and you can't sell, be selling wolf tickets. It really takes place within the octagon or, the, or, or within the ring, which is a misnomer. You know, it's not a ring if there's four sides to it, right? But in life, of course, you can always like game the rules and change the goalposts. Like, oh yeah, you you've got overrepresentation of Asians in the elite institutions of higher learning. Well, we got to change the rules now because there's too many of you people around here. And okay, the reason I'm talking about this is because the yellow people know not just in the U.S. but but globally that they're slated for elimination for racial elimination just as surely as the jews were slated for racial racial based elimination under the third reich right i see similar signs you know there was a newspaper called der Sturmer, der Sturmer, edited by julius steiker that just on and on the same rhetoric over and i'm seeing the same process going on in these these publications like politico all the left liberal ones and even the indie ones that height the racial dimension, but from the opposite direction. And they're not against any one special group. They're against the human species. So in many ways, we in 2023 are in far more jeopardy than the Third Reich ever was. Because now the enemy in their mind of the globalists, and there's only gonna be a few of them that r remain in their minds. And that's the main topic today. What are they going to do when all of us are gone? Where are they going to go? Right. Uh, well, I think I have some answers. Um, and I'm going to end this talk with them on a more speculative note on um, the redundancy and the irrelevancy of all these little underground shelters that these people are building. They've been building these, and I'm getting ahead of myself, in earnest, especially after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those are the ones that saw the actual film. Right, exposed by Harry Mimura. That shit, I'm, I don't want that to happen to me. We're going to start burrowing underground. And they haven't stopped. And they intensified after 9 11. That was another one of the pre. It never let a disaster go to waste. That's another reason why, why that operation took place so they could fund these bills to improve quote unquote infrastructure around the White House. So, anyway, I'll talk about these books in a moment, but let me just finish up my intro here. I'm going to divide this talk into two main parts. The first is this apocalyptic imagination that we've been, we, those of us who were in the post-war period, right, let's say the 50s to 2020s, we've been trained incessantly with, with apocalypse, right, apocalypse now. Not the soft apocalypse of the bioweapons, but the hard apocalypse, apocalypse you know, of, of Agent Orange and Napalm and of Dow Chemicals and the ordnance flying three miles high, right? So we're, I'm going to try to trace a little bit of that trajectory and not spend too much. And I'm going to talk about the Asian response to it because it is directed against the Asian world, right? Supposedly, according to a faux pas or a off the cuff comment by RFK Jr. The people who are gonna sp be spared this round of, of uh, decimation. Decimation goes back to the Bible where um, one out of 10 male children were, were, were selected to be killed, right? To sacrifice, Dessa 10, right? That uh, saying that the Ashkenazi Jews and the Chinese are, are not, susceptible as much statistically and it has been born out statistically we are dealing with a race specific 
bioweapon, right, with you know what. Again, I don't want to be zotched on tube you because I want to do my show next week <laughs> and beyond, hopefully. And, and you're smart enough to know what I'm talking about. So this is not conspiracy theory or even RFK, who's a presidential candidate. And Biden says, well, I'm not going to give him uh, Secret Service protection. I just want him to go around with a big target print, you know, painted on himself. Um, you know, it's in other words, it's it's not uh, boutique knowledge anymore. It's like for general consumption. All right. And the and the understanding was the tacit understanding of amongst Americans was, well, that's okay because it's it's race specific, but it's for the Chinaman. You know, it's for the Asian, especially the East Asian, maybe, maybe the South Asians, because they're pretty smart too, man. They invented arithmetic, cosmology. You know, they have all them secret knowledge. Right. You know, Herman Hesse's grandfather was an Orientalist. They studied, you know, the Germans were very much just what was going on in that part of the world. They wanted that secret knowledge of Maria Orsich, uh, Madame Blavatsky from Ukraine. You know the story because you're you're a subscriber, so you're up at that knowledge base already. I have to go through it. So this is what um uh they've got maybe I should go right to it, but I'm gonna talk about uh, just in case you tune out because you find that I'm just too long-winded. It's the subway system. I figured this out by writing it incessantly and in whatever big city I go into, I always take the subway and I explore it as a destination in itself just to check it out. Because to me, like a subway is revealing of how this, this um, metropolitan area, wherever it may be, thinks of itself in, in, in terms of um, the global system, right? And the, and the countries have the best underground transportation are the ones that feel most vulnerable for the fourth nuclear attack on Asia. The first three being Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the third one, as I've said, Fukushima. So we're going to talk about the Tokyo subway system, <laughs> which is excellent. Uh, Beijing has an excellent one. I was in Nanjing for the first time in my life. And I, was, I was astounded. They had a really good under. It's not as big as the city as Beijing, but the underground system, the subway system's excellent. Most of these are newer, too, so they benefit from the fact of uh, newer technologies. But the point is they're building these, and it's not strictly for moving large numbers of people around. It's for national security. It's for civil defense, if you will. Right, because you what you think they're going to stay on top of the ground while the, while the U.S. is for the third time in its history nuking, you know, an Asian country. Right, fool me once, fool me twice, fool me three times. Oh no, no, we're we're going to start building subways, and who's going to protest that? They can say, well, you're building too many battleships, you're building too many cruisers. You, you this is not part of our arms agreement. You have too many nukes. But no one's going to say your subway system's too good. Your subway system is so good that it can help people live for 60 days underground, hundreds of thousands of people to sustain the massive firestorms up up above and maybe the first initial bursts of uh, radiation. Right. And this is not re really written about in this term. You know, I, I won't claim to have this pioneering insight. I'm sure someone must have thought of this before. But for the most part, everybody is just thinking about the system being a people mover instead of a people protector, right? We're going to see a little video so you get an idea. Many of you have been to these places, and you're you're like me. You're like, wow, what a architectural, what a Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, if we, you know, the equivalent there. What an engineering marvel this is. Human beings are so resourceful and ingenious, right? But we don't think about, well, this is really for their self-protection. Of course, we know it has, it's integral to the economic functioning of these large metropolitan areas and the world economy, right? But it's not as easily taken out as, you know, the um, internet and the, the power grid. They have their own power supplies underneath. And Tokyo had already had an underground system of uh, tunnels um, under Tokyo in particular, which is sea level and was always historically prone to flooding. 
since uh, Japan, you know, all the countries in the part. The, the, the reason why they're so verdant countries and all those growing rice is that, you know, they, they have a monsoonal climate. It's always raining. It's wet. All right. So they have this this technology that they're quite well acquainted with. So you got Beijing, you got South Korea. And one that I haven't been yet, uh, which I'd like to, is in Moscow. And they have uh, art. You know, it's some of that, I don't know the history of it, so I'm not going to guess, but it looks like they were they, they retained a lot of the older underground systems with, with the improvements they did. And unlike these other places, which are more, they're still interesting, but they're more utilitarian because you got hundreds of thousands, millions per year going through really quick because you're, you're, you're on a schedule, you know, the train's going to leave. And so they have to, so everybody's running. They don't have really time to look around, but the uh, Moscow train station looks, the underground looks uh, incredible. And I'll show you a little clip there and I'm going to uh, investigate a little bit more. And there's some other adaptations for uh, for World War, the, the, the fifth attack on Japan. And it's seen in really innocuous expressions of their culture, right? Which is, a, it's a martial culture, you know, martial meaning military culture, right? They never, they never left it. All, all the secret societies that were supposedly done away with, with under the MacArthur administration, run under SCAPs of Rink commander and all, all that um, run out of, um, where was it? Akasaka building. I, I know it because the the Fulbright building was in the Akasaka building where MacArthur was. I didn't learn this until later on. That's where the occupation had their main office after the occupation ended. I think it was 156, 1956, something like that. Then they brought in the Fulbright says, well, we're going to cultivate a new generation of Japanese who are pro-American and anti-communist. And they only got them part of the way because they know that, well, <laughs> you pulled the trigger on us twice and we're, we're going to get, we'll be ready the next time. We're going underground. All right. So, so they do it in uh, their, their military, their martial defense. I'm talking about Japan in specific, uh, has been through innocuous cultural expression, including toys, Right. Games, video games, more specifically, anime, manga. I talked about this last week when, when I was dealing with the hipster. Right. Please watch that one. Didn't get a lot of views because it said in praise of hipsters. If I said, I hate hipsters, it probably would have got 2000 overnight <laughs> views. But if it's in praise of anybody who's outside your little club or, or our suppers, which is not our club because we don't belong there anyway. Right, it's got you know to paraphrase Groucho Marx. You think it's your club, but you're not a member. <laughs> so watch that one. But I talk about their fascination with all things Japan, right? So that was a that is a the type of diplomacy that's so clever. Let them fall in love with the culture, the food, the the toys, the music, all the what seems to be superficial part of it. In the meantime, we're building the infrastructure for the, the 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 next attack on the Japanese homeland, right? And the Koreans are doing the same. I don't know about Pyongyang. I haven't been to North Korea, uh, but South Korea is heavy, heavily fortified. And by the way, they're not doing it in a vacuum. They're doing it because they're, both countries, Japan and South Korea, are still occupied to the tens of thousands of troops, Air Force, and Navy of U.S. military. So these are occupied countries. They're first-rank co countries, but they are still colonies of America, military colonies. So they have the gun, the nuclear gun, or the bioweapon pointed at their heads, right? So leadership understands that, right? And you got this. I won't go so far it's a limited hand because I respect the 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 work that this writer put into it. His name's Garrett Graff, uh, Raven Rock, but it's too little too late. Or why is he revealing and all his researchers and the publishers, right? Probably some Hachette owned, not some Chinese, Chinese, Chicom. Yeah, Simon and Schuster. It's probably some British or, or German publishing company by now, you know, Simon & Schuster is just a brand. It's no longer Simon & Schuster that we grew up with in the old days. They wouldn't be publishing this stuff if it wasn't already obsolete knowledge. 
So that got me to thinking as I was reading. I said, I'm reading about ancient history. There's got to be something more. So, and this is, we'll finish up my introduction after 30 minutes of talking. The last part of this talk will be about my, hypo this is <clears throat> hypothetical. I, I can I can hypothesize as long as I tell you that this is hypothetical. All right, I want you to mull it over because the big boys and the big girls, right, it's strategic defense centers around the country, Pentagon or academic or and corporate all over the world. They've workshopped this already. And my guess is that all this hardware and all this steel, re, the concrete reinforced uh, burrowing underground and the 25 ton blast doors that one person, if they're so delicately balanced that one person and all those stories, uh, you know, Raven Rock and all there's 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 dozens of them, maybe scores in the US alone that we know of. And they're all over the world too. This is old technology. And what so what 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 is really going to take place? Well, the government is going to be run hologra holographically. It already is to a large extent. Right. So these are, are not places for the Congress people to evacuate to, right? You know that story. There's a train that Leads right out of D.C., goes out of West Virginia, right under a hotel that's been dug out, and it's like a mirror Congress, right? Yeah, it's a cute story. It's like, but but that's not how it's going to be run. Most of those guys will be dead anyway. Like most of the people, and, and so so what's going to happen? Right, it's going to be a program. It's going to be a holographic program. So I'm going to end this talk on here to show you how it's already been rolled out again. It's always rolled out in seemingly innocuous fashion, entertaining, healthful, beneficial. But really, this is how, and I'll, I'll, I'll put even a finer point on this. I think the election 2024 is going to be the first hologram, fully 100% holographic election, U.S. presidential election, to be specific, all right? So with all respects to Mike Lindell and all the hardships he's going through with my pillow being debanked and deplatformed and everything else, right? I have respect for any person who is operating on sincere patriotic principles, but that's not what I'm criticizing. What I am saying that he's but the train has left the station already. There will be no appeal to the Constitution. The Constitution will be there. Right. It's going to be in a little glass case or maybe it'll be a repro. Maybe there'll be a holographic projection on it. But government, as we know, it has already been was workshop decades ago to become holographic. And I've seen signs of this early on, but but these um, indications get more salient as, as time uh, grows. My first indication, I'll tell you my first indication what what the big boys were up to when I read this book called MIT. Media Lab. Yeah, I think that's the full time. Am I, you know, doesn't stand for Made in Taiwan. It stands for Massachusetts Institute of Technology. MIT Media Lab. And it was authored by Stuart Rand. Does that name ring a bell? He's the guy with the Whole Earth Catalog. He was the guy, uh, I don't know how friendly he was with Timothy Leary, but I put him in that same bag, right, of these techno hallucinati. Right, technology and hallucinogens and altered states and higher consciousness are going to take us to the new American revolution. And there's a newer generation of them that I'm tracking very closely. One of one of the ringleaders, a guy named Eric Davis, E I E R I K Davis, who in later career, he's a propagandist for all this, decided, well, I'm out, I wrote all this stuff, I was going to get a PhD out of this. So he took his writings and a book he did and and some some jive ass university accepted as a doctoral dissertation, which is not typically done. Doctoral dissertation has to be done from scratch and it has to be original. It's not some some stuff that you wrote for some, your company or on your spare time. Right. And I know because that's my world. You understand? But he knew that he had, in order to have some credibility, he needed those initials behind his name. 
And I say, why does he need that kind of credentials? Because he's the new Stuart Brand. He's the new Timothy Leary. He's the new um, academic connection that's servicing the Bankman Freeds of the future and the present down in the Silicon Valley, DARPA Valley, Pentagon Valley. Right. These guys are totally into ayahuasca hallucinogens and alternate realities and new age. And um, I won't say non-Christian. I'll say I'll go all the way. I'll say anti-Christian. Right. They'd be rocking the Gnostic gospel, if there, which is a contradiction in terms, you know, with a small G. And that there's tons of literature on so we're being barraged. People keep talking, oh yeah, the 60s, Laurel Tini and the Grateful Dead. Uh, or Owsley Acid and Monterey, like, man, you were living decades old. I'm, I want to talk about 2023, right? This is going on now, just like the holographic election of 2024 is right on our doorstep. But you want to talk about Raven Rock. I mean, you know, it's fascinating to me as history, but I'm also operating in a survival mode along with you. And I want to. I want the powers to be to understand that there's some of, um, of us MFs out here <laughs> that know what's going down, and are going to be communicating that message to the world, including the message about all the phonies, the hallucinati phonies, and the New Agers. That I can't even call them New Ager them because that that comes from like the '60s and '70s and '80s, and we know about Hal Pudoff and SRI and. Uh, and uh, Charles Tart and all that we read about it, and Ingo Swan, all the books are out there, they've written books. But okay, historically, that's important. But we're in 2020. Same with the UFOers, right? We know that that literature was out there, right? And we don't need the government or so called whistleblowers to tell us what everyday people have been been seeing for millennia, not decades, millennia, <laughs> right? Flying machines or people with wings, you know, creatures. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot that uh, we need to explore there. I'm not, and I'm not saying don't explore. I'm just saying, push yourself, extend yourself to the present and into the true future, not the bullshit future that Philip K. Dick was paid to put out there to condition our level, our low level of expectations. When I say low level, he was already writing from the perspective of a post nuclear, post apocalyptic, post um, unified global totalitarian government. He was already writing from that perspective uh, by the late 50s, certainly by the early 60s, right? Man in the High Castle, what published 1962. Was he prescient? Was he brilliant? Yeah, he was brilliant. He was prescient. He was well read. He was an organic intellectual. Right? He didn't even last an entire academic year at UC Berkeley, but that doesn't mean anything. Right? Unless you want to become someone who's working over at uh, the Lawrence Livermore Lab or for the Bank of America across the Bay in San Francisco, it doesn't mean anything. So I'm not taking anything away from him, but that was a packet that he and others, the whole science fiction group, all of them were handed this packet, right? Because everybody just talks about Gene Roddenberry and Rod Serling, blah, blah, blah. But I'm talking about the ones that, the, who were doing the writing and the, the pulps as well as, as the novels and the fiction. And they're still with us today. I'm fine. I'm reading them right now, right? And they're predicting eco-catastrophe. That's why I'm talking about it now because they are also part of this apocalypto culture that's being presented to us incessantly. So our immune systems will be suppressed, right? And whatever strain of whatever they have being cooked up in, in Fresno, California, it's gonna have an easier time of it, right? Taking over our, our bodies. By the way, the reason why I mentioned Fresno, California, there was a huge illegal biolab, Chinese-owned, discovered, quote-unquote discovered, in Reedley, California, which is in Fresno County. It's 
outside of uh, Fresno is in Central California. I'm in North Northern California, roughly just for those of you who aren't are not familiar with this area. It's roughly in the middle of California, between Sacramento, where I am, me and my good buddy, Kevin Newsom, the future president of the United States, the future holographic president of the United States. Uh, it's halfway between Sac um, Sacramento and Hollywood for the better looking people, LA. It's right in the middle, and it's in the agricultural area. Yeah, it was, it was found there. Right, which gives greater urgency to what I'm talking about here because all the prep work for all the ordinance, for the uh, the warheads that are going to be raining on us from the sky is irrelevant because this is probably, I'm not, here I'm guessing, okay, I'm spec I don't want to create panic or add to the panic, but do you think this is the only biolab that's run by foreign powers here in the continental United States? Do you understand why everybody's saying, oh, look at the people coming over the border on them brown people, all them military age Chinese men, which I haven't seen one on any tape or anything. Why do you think all that's coming out now? Because like Ukraine and Putin was on this, they're setting up a whole network of bio labs. Well, they, they did in Ukraine. I'm not saying it's in the U.S. I don't have any knowledge of that. I'm just extrapolating like any good, any thinking person would. Uh, I'll post that article on my Patreon because you know what? It's not getting any play on mainstream news or on indie news, right? Because indie news are now part, they've been clawed back to the, to the legacy media as well. Most of them have been. They've been for a while, but now it's really obvious. Okay, so that's where I'm going to end up with. All right. So where does apocalypto culture come from? By the way, apocalypto, I'm using that term purpose, purposely because that was a film uh, directed by Mel Gibson. All right, an excellent one. Check that one out. All right, people are, you know, deal with him as a personality, but, but look at him as an actor and as a director and as a producer, right? Check out Apocalypto. I'm not. I can go on and on, but I won't do it. But Apocalypse Now, 1979, Francis Ford Coppola, who's now a gentleman wine grower in Napa, Illuminati Valley, Sonoma, you know, Mendocino, where all the Disney families are, and the Rothschilds and the Mondavi and the Shrek family, right? And these are all families that give generously to University of California Davis, my previous employer because they're known worldwide for the enology program enology winemaking viticulture right which goes back centuries right to the mist the mystery of the religions you know they they use these intoxicants just like they're using them in uh, silicon or pentagon darpa valley right Masad valley right same so anyway, he's he's a wine uh, um, monsignor or uh, maestro, you know, Coppola. Uh, and then, of course, before that, to, to earn his bones, he had to do The Godfather, which he barely hung on for dear life. <laughs> he, also, he thought he was going to get fired every day. Uh, Co-written by Mauro Puzo, who I do respect, because he came up in the pulp world, in the world of magazines, when print culture was still, was in its heyday. You know, people would subscribe to magazines. They'd buy newspapers, three editions a day, you know, in the big cities. And he was getting paid, you know, a penny a word. That's my type of writer. One of the, not these guys who come out of these um, uh, writing programs, the CIA-funded creative writing program, like the one at Iowa State, right? or is it University of Iowa? You know, I don't know. But it's one, it's one of the, the – book, the book written on that was called Finks. It's about the whole – uh, cultivation of a generation of uh, literary writers by the Iowa Writers Workshop, right? So these guys were outside of that because they were writing lowbrow type of material. Later on, they were clawed into that. They were science fiction became normal. It became cool. And then all those little tiny titles were bought up and then became part of Simon and Sue Schuster. And Simon and Schuster became part of uh, mega publishers, you know, headquarters, Geneva, Switzerland, right? You, you get the idea. And then 
It's also the apocalyptic, well, Apocalypse Now was, um, I, I think he got co-writing credits for the screenplay. A guy named Michael Herr, H-E-R-R, -R, Dispatches. Anybody read that? Of, of my, they, you know, 1977, I remember when it came out. I read, I read all the books in the post-Vietnam War period that were being published by soldiers, veterans, or journalists, or historians had been there. There was a whole slew of material. And I made it my job to read every single one of them as they came to press, right? So there was a kind of a golden age of reportage and journalism and fiction, right? There was one, uh, a really good novel that's not really talked about um, that much, you know, going after Cacciato, kind of magical realism. And it's based on this guy's, um, experience in the jungles of Vietnam, right? And then John Milius, that's a name. It's part of this apocalyptic culture. Big Wednesday, 1978, probably the only good surf movie besides on any Wednesday, the Bruce Brown films, right? The surfing movies. He was a surfer himself, starring um, John Michael Vinson, I think, and William Catt. <clears throat> K-A-T-T, -T, and he also later, he later directed Conan the Barbarian, 1982, because uh, Milius was, was well known when he was a film student at USC. He was preceded by uh, Harry, um, uh, what's his name again? Harry, not Keaton, I know a guy named Harry Keaton, uh, the director, because that was the place from the 20s. You want to study cinema, you, you went to USC. Now it's just a bunch of wannabes who want a deal. You know, they want to get a Netflix deal and write globalist anti-human films, especially about race or CRT, whatever is on the on the uh, menu of the of the globalists right now, UNESCO, whoever it might be. So anyway, there's this whole culture. And, and really, if you want to go back to the beginning, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because it all comes out of the heart of darkness, Joseph Conrad, right? Because uh, apart from these wankers like Milius who glorified violence, right? He was known for that. U.S. Everybody was a leftist or liberal of his classmates, people like uh, George Lucas at USC and the other ones, you know. But he was on the right. This is before being on the right became cool, right? Um. They all drew, they're all equally inspired by Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. I mentioned this before in previous talks, but Heart of Darkness, uh, unlike these wankers, like the, who I just mentioned, who never went to war, uh, never reported it on it. They read about it and they saw movies about it. Um, and that's probably the most noxious part of the, my, you know, this, this, the Vietnam War generation. That's why I wanted to read the books by people who had been there and experience it whether i like you know agree with or not was not really relevant i needed to hear from their perspective from their point of view people like michael her right dispatches and um still still an excellent book to read but it comes out of joseph conrad and the reason why that book is so compelling and why it's a classic is because he was there he was in the heart of darkness and that was published in 1898 in english right He's known as a British writer, but he was he was born in Poland. I can't ever pronounce his his birth name, but he had a Polish name. No, it was not Wojciech Frakowski or Zbigniew Wrazinski or but you know, it was along those lines. I just I just call him Joseph Conrad like you. But he was con he had a two year deal as a riverboat pilot. I think he was on the Congo, the Congo River or one of its tributaries. He had a two-year, I think it was two-year contract to go up and down there to, uh, to ferry people around and goods and whatnot. And this was in the height of King Leopold's mines and devastation of uh, Southern Africa and the Congo. And they called it back then, it was called the Belgian Congo, right? These are the Sachs, Coburn, Gotha, all those people, the ones that, that married into all the different royal, the, all the bloodlines that are still with us today. That's why I'm mentioning it here. Now, Conrad didn't write about that, but he was really telling us about that world that they had created, right? These, um, the, the royalty, the predatory royal, and the same people who wanted the rich uranium for a to to uh, to fuel big, big man and, and fat boy, right? 
Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One was the conventional, if there is such a thing, nuclear weapon, and the Nagasaki one was plutonium. Right. And of course, my ex colleague at UC Davis, when I say I'm just mean that loosely because I think he was gone by the time I showed up, Edward Teller, as you know, was pushing for the hydrogen. He wanted to go for all of it. He definitely, he must have been one of the, you know, I'm reading about like, where do these guys come from? What bloodline, you know, do they represent? I think he was a, I'm reading this one. It's, it's written by a rabbi. It talks about the whole bloodline of Esau. And the, it's biblical. E-S-A, you know the story, but um, uh, Yaqub or Jacob in, in Esau, right? So read about that. I think that's where, where Teller came from. A lot of those, um, the other Rav, who were doing this nuclear type of uh, weapon. There's nothing about defense. It was all about destruction of humanity. And, and they're the ones who are um, like the Secretary of Health who are men but are dressing as women or the Secretary of Navy who were born men but are women or are um, women's and gender studies and like Judith Butler who had these endowed chairs at Yale, Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, wherever and are promoting uh, post-genderism. Right? It's the same bloodline. There's a direct line that connects all of them back to uh, Esau and uh, Jacob. From my reading, from my understanding of Bible, both the uh, Tanakh and uh, the you know New Testament, the, the testaments of Jesus the Christ, it's it's all, it's all there, right? It's operating on so many different, including the historical and and political, of course. In addition to the spiritual, metaphysical inspirational right? but it, it's there's a lot of information hard information there and this is what biblical scholars themselves uh, tell us all right so um so yeah the uh, uh, Japanese said okay we're we're not gonna we're not gonna go up against the mighty us and their British lords banking lords so we're gonna do video games we're gonna go into transformers we're gonna do mecha or mecha I'm not really sure you know like mecha Godzilla Mecha Gojira, you know. And now I told her there's a whole stream of of academics who are studying Japanese popular culture, and it, it's like they ruined it. They ruined it. It's like a beautiful butterfly just around, you know, fluttering in all its God-given beauty and then putting a net on it and sticking a pin on it and putting it on a board and studying it. Right. Isn't that what Alfred Kinsey did at the Kinsey Institute? He was into fruit flies. And from there, he extrapolated how human, human beings supposedly engage in their sexuality. Right. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll return to this topic of how Japan, quote, demilitarized without really demilitarizing after World War II. Um, all right. The next part I wanted to talk about is that how this works in is that we know, speaking of the Bible, that they're all, that the quest for immortality has been with us probably since the beginning, right? It's the envy, the jealousy of God, the father of the creator, right? What, what, what can, what could stand up to that? The majesty, the power of that, the supremacy of it, the immortality, because that's God. God, you know, the, the term immortality probably doesn't even apply to God because, you know, he's beyond that. Right? But human beings, if they could have it for themselves, can be as close to God as they dream. And, it, and, that, and that dream has, it's waxed and waned, but it's never ended. And we, we're seeing this right now as we live and breathe in 2023. We're seeing these manifestations of it. Just recently, we saw Jeffrey Epstein, right? What was Zorro Ranch about? And I'm, I'm really, really anxious to hear, you know, read some leakage out of that area. I know it wasn't just a, you know, a, ranch, a working ranch with cows and horses, maybe so, but but they were he was into genetic experimentation he wanted to use his germline to create this immortal race of people 
maybe not for his own personal mortality, but the mortality of his bloodline, his germline. So this is not speculation on my part. That was probably his biggest liability to the powers that be. Because as we know, uh, and I don't mean to be sound cavalier about this, we know that child trafficking, with trafficking of female and boys and well, of, human, of adult males is, is commonplace in, around the world, not in America, it's to, to this day. But what's really destabilizing, uh, if the world were to find out about it, is, is if the knowledge of Zorro Ranch were to leak out. And so long as he was in prison, Jeffrey Epstein, he could have given up the goods, the family jewels, so to speak. Right. And another name that you might not be so familiar with, although I did a check on Tubu and there's lots of material on him. Uh, but there's only one book that I found. Thank you for my Patreon subscribers. You allowed me to pick up a used copy of this. It's called Predator King, subtitled... Peter Nygaard's Dark Life of Rape, Drugs, and Blackmail. All right, it says the subtitle is Dark Life of Rape, Drugs, and Blackmail. All right, again, not to minimize those criminal types of behavior, but his real agenda, the reason why he was put in that position anyway, Nygaard, Peter Nygaard, is kind of like Epstein, the quest for immortality. Because again, these people want to survive the Holocaust in whatever shape or form it hits us. But it's not going to be this old tech. They're going to do it through holography. If anything, these um, facilities here are just giant production studios to, to uh, manufacture holographic performances of the president, the secretary of defense, of the vice president. There's a whole line of succession, as you know about, right? They can have all of them there, and and the, and, the, and the virtual congressman, and I'm not talking about simple VR too. We know we know about that. You anyway, know, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So we got these characters: Jeffrey Epstein, Peter Nygaard, uh, I think um, it's that guy Joe Ichito of the MIT, the disgraced uh, MIT Media Lab guy who was on the payroll of Jeffrey Epstein. Right? I think he was into it. I don't know what level. I think he, he might have just been sort of like the switch man for the monies and the funding and all that. Um, and and within the academic research world in general, right, I just gave you the personalities, Epstein, Nygaard, you know that. But, but even more troubling is the fact there's a whole research infrastructure built on synthetic biology. Right, the so-called um, bioeconomy. I'll just show you very quickly the just books in my collection. I'm not going to believe the point because this is not academic uh, lecture, right? Virtual immortality. This is a 300, 400 page book, right? Here's your table of contents. I don't know if you can read it. I don't know if it's even. I'm just trying to show you that these people are thinking about it, and you're not going to get this on in on YouTube Entertainment. You're going to get it here because I want to show you that this is far bigger than the Manhattan Project ever was, right? They got that Jai British produced PSYOP Oppenheimer running. And I'm, I admit, I haven't seen it yet. I don't know if I'm going to torture myself for three hours to, to watch a British production of American history, just like they did with uh, Professor Marston, Wonder Woman. There are all these British American historical topics being done by British directors, and actors, too. They're taking jobs away from the actor. They should be uh, up in arms and directors because it's not the Chacoms who are in charge of this. It's the city of London. That's the point I'm trying to make. Here it is, the virtual future. Okay, that's enough of that. Here's um, the proceedings of a, of a uh, conference, virtual, augmented, and mixed reality. When was this? 2017, yeah, just a few years ago, not that long ago. Man, if you could see how many papers were delivered, you would boggle your mind just reading the topics, what they're what they're up to, what's coming down the pike. All right. And Politico is not able to tell you these guys here who are hired and handpicked by the publishers and the editors 
his mommy and daddy, they're probably, you know, they went to Yale or Stanford or Harvard and his sister's probably in publishing. They're all hooked up, man. That's why a yellow man like me can't get a contract. I'm kind of like Justin Lin. I don't fit, you know, the basketball player. I don't fit the profile. You know, I got to be Mr. Miyagi or I don't exist. So anyway, you know, this is old news. So I want to see something critical about regenesis. Unfortunately, this is just for an academic on. This is for a general educated on. I want to see something that for a general educated critical audience about what's going on in academic research. This is called regenesis. I mean, the whole title itself is—is is that not hubris? Is this not the height of arrogance? Is not a, the primary example of of this um, this defamation of God? Re Genesis? Oh, that, that's some heavy mojo. He's calling himself. This is George Church. Of course, he's an atheist. Doesn't believe the Bible. Doesn't believe, so it doesn't really. He thinks he's immune from it. And the subtitle is How Synthetic Biology Will Reinvent Nature and Ourselves. So that kind of expands on the arrogance of regenesis. How synthetic biology will reinvent nature and ourselves. And they've got their colleagues over in the Harvard, you know, humanities and the English and the comparative so-called performance studies, which just has gays and lesbians only in it. Right? They're remaking the whole world on the qualitative level while the big boys and the hard sciences are remaking them on a science level. So who is George Church? All right, according to the blurb here, he's a professor of genetics at the Harvard Medical School. <laughs> oh, man, he's no slouch. He's at the top. That's why I bought the book. I want to see what he's up to. And he's got the guy. Uh, he, he's probably a science journalist. Because most of these guys can't, you know, these researchers, they can't or won't or don't right. They don't even do their own research. They have some Chinese uh, doctoral students that they exploit for five, six, seven years before they give them their stamp of approval and send them back to Beijing or Wuhan. Right. At George Church is, doesn't do the wet lab stuff. They, they don't do the writing. They have the grad students do it. So they got Ed Regis, who's a co-author. At least they can co-author credit. Anyway, I'm just kind of giving the, the inside lowdown on how, how this how this knowledge industry really works, how it operates, and why we don't need to bow down to it. Why don't we have to respect it, right? And we why we should question it. Right? Someone sent me, I don't know if they were a Patreon person or a subscriber to this channel. I get really quality comments and feedback. It's very rare these days that I get comments from ass clowns. You know, that, that used to be more prevalent in the early days. Um, but they pointed out that uh, the guy who uh, was he, I can't remember what institution it was, but um, some dickhead, I can't remember his name, but uh, he's in an American university. He was, he was, he's like one of the kingpins of um, bioethics, right? And uh, he's been called on the carpet um, for uh, plagiarism <laughs> of, his, of his doctoral dissertation. Right? Your doctoral dissertation is your your um, calling card to this higher calling of, of a lifelong commitment to learning and knowledge and, dare I say, wisdom. And that was, it was bogus. But this guy knew about AI. So what he did was he subjected his own dissertation to these plagiarism software. There is software like that, by the way, in case you didn't know. So if you have kids who are adult kids, when I say kids, I mean adult children, uh, in college, you tell them that most of their papers are being run through software for plagiarism, right? That's why on my patron, I'm giving you, and to pass on to your adult college age kids, new topics that ha don't have all these papers written that the people are buying, you know, students, they buy that stuff. Are you kidding? Yeah, they're not going to take time to, to write their own research paper. It's going to cut into their, their screen time of, of doing uh, TikTok, you know, or, or doing prostitution on the weekends or going yachting, you know, with some rich millionaire from Silicon Valley. So they can buy that stuff. So I'm saying do the work. So I'll post some of these articles there. This would be a good topic for your, 
your college student there because college classes are about to resume. So what else? Anything other book? Here's another bio citizenship. Yeah, we're being re redefined as a as a as a uh, citizen on biological grounds. This is your bud sample right here. All right here's all the big shots. You know their whole names. I'm sure they're very proud of themselves and their big shots and their students and you know all the all the uh, doctoral students and the postdocs want a job. Oh, well along the same lines as their mentors. That's how, that's how it works. And that's how the uh, system perpetuates itself. But I'm just, and that's why I focus on, on, the, on the reality that a lot of this research is bogus, including its so-called bioethics. All right. I told you about the Canadian MF, who, who was the president of Stanford. Did I hear about this? Maybe I didn't. He resigned recently. The president of Stanford, he's a Canadian... Um, intelligence asset because academic, it's called academic misconduct. It could be anything, but usually it's um, plagiarism or, or he was manipulating research results. Okay. And I'm telling you this, these are not one-offs. This is a consistent pattern. You understand that? And I don't like to just for the sake of sensational and tell you sensationalism, tell you this. I'm telling us so that we can decolonize our minds from this tyranny of enslavement by the scientific establishment, you know, of Anthony Fauci rocking the little lab coat saying, I am science, worship me, pull down your pants, bend over. I am science. I am Dr. Anthony Fauci. Okay, because they're just human beings like you and me. They're corruptible. They're fallible. They are not gods. And we have to bear a lot of the responsibility for allowing these people like feces to float to the top. All right. So let's just skim off that top and throw it in the garden and use it for fertilizer for our herb gardens. All right. There'll be more feces that floats to the top, but we know the pattern now. We know the cycle. And what, my project here on the Professor Hamamoto channel is de to demystify a world that 99% of you will never see from the inside out. But I've been there and I've done that. All right. And I understand it. And I've been through their little mill. You've heard the stories enough, so I won't tell you about my, my, my tale of woe. Because <laughs> I had a pretty darn good career, if I may say so myself. Uh, okay. Okay, this also fits in. I'm, I'll, I'll speed it up here because we're already one hour into the show. This whole embrace of alien life forms, our space brothers, the whole blue beam, all this is going on, right? So called disclosure, UAP, right? Recent congressional testimony. Everybody in the independent media is saying, oh, this guy <laughs> looks like he's autistic or uh, he knows how to read a script. He looks like, a, you know, well, they're missing the, <clears throat> the whole point. The whole timing <clears throat> of this is to bring us into this new post-truth, post-three-dimensional reality to the holographic political centralized control of 2024. And again, all apologies to Michael Lindell, but you can say that you're in violation of the Constitution. We're going to sue you this time. The court system is beyond repair at this point. All right. There might be hope and there might be spontaneous healing. Right? God may come down and say, OK, OK, Job, you suffered enough. You Americans, you people of the world, you suffered enough. I'm going to come down. I'm going to start cleaning the house. I mean, we'd all like to see that. But in the meantime, it's on us. It's always on us. We're the one we're the ones that allowed this to happen. All right. So, uh, and and then I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago, the film that was written, directed Steve Quayle, Lies of God and Men, excellent. <clears throat> Talks about this whole, the timing of all this, of alien, of humanity being seeded by aliens from outer space, not created by God, but by aliens, right? All this is coming to the fore right now right, in this sort of military tip of the spear movement. 
and of course the transsexualism, the medical, pharmacological, transsexual, postsexual revolution that is being put into play right, and that's being challenged quite um, aggressively by medical people themselves as well as by the general public. But the, but the point is, it's part of this larger program. They're not discrete. They're not discrepant. They're related components in this larger uh, Raven Rock post-apocalypto culture. <clears throat> okay, so part two, the next part here. How did I get into this? Well, first I was going to do a more pedestrian review of this. Let's see, when did it come out? 2018, four or five years ago. Doomsday, Doomsday Machine. Subtitled Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. You know the name, Daniel Ellsberg. I respect him enormously. <clears throat> uh, I read his work. I followed his work when I, I think it was in college when, when all this, you know, the, the, the um, Pentagon paper controversy, papers controversy was was raging. This is bigger, bigger than um, uh, WikiLeaks. It was the wiki. Let me just say, not bigger or smaller. Let's say it was to put it in context. Was the wiki leaks up its time, kind of like that, right? Lassange, uh, Edward Snowden, and uh, Chelsea Manning, right? Combined. So, for those of you who weren't weren't around, so I have a lot of respect for him. And I did, by the way, I I was at. I'll talk about it more next week. But I was at the 50th anniversary of the bombing of uh, Hiroshima with atomic weapons. And um, there was international press, <clears throat> people giving interviews. It's a large peace park, it's called, right? Hiroshima International Peace Park. And um, this was in the evening and there was a gentleman being lit up giving an interview. And so I walked over just curious to see what was going on. And who was it being interviewed? But Daniel Ellsberg, <laughs> he was in Hiroshima. Ground near ground zero. And I go, oh, that's Daniel Ellsberg. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Uh, anyway, I'll tell you more about that <clears throat> next time. So I started out that way, and I was uh, truthfully, I have to say, I'm it's pretty disappointed with the first third of the book. Uh, I think a better book for you to start with would be, of his, would be Secrets, a Memoir of, v of Vietnam and Pentagon Papers. That's specifically about the Pentagon Papers. This book specifically is about his larger role as being a planner of atomic warfare, right? He was one of the Rand Corporation employees, right? And it's, it's interesting to me how he rose through the ranks on a personal and professional level, because that's my world through the academic ranks. He walked away from an academic position, probably a, a pretty good one, uh, at one of the uh, top, you know, the name brands. He's a Harvard guy himself. He, he had all kinds of contacts, going back to his father's. His father was the head of the plant in um, Detroit that was building these um you know, bombers and fighters for the war. So he's a second generation war armaments, um, well, war maker. He wasn't a soldier, but he was part of that, that uh, swords uh, movement, you know, swords and, and, and armaments that he later tried to turn into plowshares. And I know he's a, he's kind of a, he's a, a figure, a historical figure that's still being debated on whether he was a good guy or a bad guy. I don't think he was either or. Right. And as um, David Cranmer and Underdown brought to our attention, um, Ellsberg was not the same time, but, you know, much earlier, was a graduate of Cranbrook, Cranbrook School outside of Detroit, this elite school where all these. So he, and I mentioned this because he was on the track to the top. All right. So I don't know whether he had a um, change of, um, of conscience. Right. If or he did it, he, he, he went against the defense establishment that nurtured him and his father and his whole family uh, out of uh, political ideology or whether he was put out there as a limited hang up. I, you know, I haven't really figured that out yet. The time will tell. Um, but in the meantime, I'm, I'm going to read this work and share it with you. So anyway, this is what inspired today's talk. 
but I realized it was not enough for me. It's very good. It's it's good for my own information on how the Harvard uh, fellows of scientists or Harvard scientist fellows. What is it called? Harvard Society of Fellows. My first first time I read how from a participant how that works. You can look and look it up, and you won't know. But he tells how it worked for him. So he was on on the track. And I found out the Harvard Society of Fellows was endowed by one of the. Uh, let's see which one of it. One of the one of the famed. Um, his name slips from my mind. It wasn't Conant, but it was a guy on that level, who was one of the architects of the post-war. Uh, Weapons annihilation, self annihilation complex. Right, that's where that's what endowed it, and that money probably came from, who knows where, you know, the black budget probably. But he got all that money. They fund him. Not a, no bills to worry about. Food taken care of, all of it. All he had to do is think deep thoughts so he can go to work for the for the national security state. And he's just one guy. All right. Where do you think these people in those books I just showed you, where do you think they come from and how they are cultivated? We are dealing with an enormous system here. Right. And with all respects to Michael and Dell, just these lawsuits in the Constitution is not going to turn it around. Not in the foreseeable future, maybe in long term future. Right, we might reach these, these the annihilation point. I don't think it's going to happen now. That's the good news is that I don't think, and I'm telling you, I don't. I think you should take self annihilation off the table right now, just so you can relax and enjoy life. Right, with your friends, go out, eat, read, go see Barbie. You know, at the local mall because they're opened again for business, from what I understand. You don't even have to wear a mask. Go on a motor tour. It's you know, still summertime. The weather's nice and it's kind of hot, but it's nice, you know, for the most part. At least it's dry. Um, and and get those dark thoughts out of your mind of self annihilation because that that's so unnecessary. And it's our side that's probably the ones that are chiefly promoting it. Sorry to say, because that's part of their. That's what keeps you coming back for the adrenaline rush to watch these shows day in and day out. The bad news, you know, fear porn, it's called, right? And we're getting it from the other side as well, but but it's our side. And it, and now there's younger people doing it. That's why I did the, the, the show on hipsters, because there's younger people who are now hopping on this bandwagon of fear porn, but from a conservative angle. Right? Because they, they've showed there's a market for it and there's sponsors for it. So it's part of their business model. So don't buy the Happy Meal. It's not a Happy Meal. It's the fear meal. And if you're old enough to know, you, you can see that it's very much like the duck and cover propaganda of the 1950s. You remember that? The last Friday or whatever day it was of the month, the teacher would say, oh, there's the siren. Everybody under your desk, duck and cover, right? Bend over and kiss your ass goodbye. She didn't say that, but that, you know. And by the way, that's the meaning of that graphic on this tube view, right? That's the proverbial guy with his head up his ass. The proverbial man who's got the whole, his head up his own ass. <laughs> I don't know how they, you know, uh, power, uh, what is it? Um, some sort of program that <laughs> allowed that. There used to be a cartoon. I collected those cartoons when I worked in offices and stuff. Whatever people posted on their little cubby space or their office, and there was always some humor or cartoon, I always asked for a copy, and I had a whole collection. And one of my favorite was a guy that had a little eight and a half by eleven Xerox of a guy with his head up his ass, and the caption on the bottom said, "Your problem is obvious." <laughs> All right, so let's pull our heads out of our our individual and our collective fear ass. Right, because all our asses are all puckered up, man. It's the pucker factor. All right, let's loosen up, pull it up. All right, 
and let the fear porn masters have a on so let's just go out and, and squeeze some fresh orange juice and lemonade and go out in the porch and you know wait till the sun comes down drink it frap a hamburger what you know whatever is fun with you you know throw the frisbee uh but but um so i'm telling you self-annihilation in the near future um is, is not going to happen it's not going to happen this is part <laughs> Of you know, people talk, you know, and I'm not denigrating it, right? I'm not making fun of it, I'm not mocking it. But people talk about the secret space program on NASA and all the sexy Nazis that funnel all these hundreds of millions of dollars off into their bank accounts. Well, this is much bigger than that, right? All this tunneling around for national security, national defense, it's related. I mean, it's probably a separate budget line, but it's probably where the action is, but it's theater. Okay, that's why I called it self-annihilation theater. And I think that was one of the secondary lessons that Stanley Kubrick, who was a Rand Corporation man, by the way, he had access to Rand in Santa Monica, where, where Ellsberg, I don't know if he ever met Ellsberg. They were, you know, roughly the same age. Uh, uh, Kubrick was a little bit older, but they, were, they, they could have crossed paths in, in theory. But he had access to that. But I think that's one of the lessons that Kubrick was telling. He was trying to communicate to us, hey, let's learn to relax and have fun with it. Right? Just like um, Chill Wills on, on the nuclear war. Yeehaw! Right? Because he realized by, by having access that it was mainly theater led by the grand old man, Albert Wollstadt. I talk about Nazis. I don't know if he really was a Nazi, but my gosh. I learned, by the way, from this book that Albert Wollstott's wife was also a national defense intellectual, a policy, a defense intellectual, right? Where do you think these characters we see around Biden and even around uh, Trump and all, where do you think they come from? Right, Amanda, Samantha Powers, all they all come from this little trick bag, and I'm trying to demystify to you. You know, they're the ones who have their rear ends up the ass of their boss, and including their own butt. So they're two headed monsters. They got their head up their own butt. I'm sorry for being so crass, but they also got their heads in the ass crack of the sec def or secretary of defense, whoever it is. Robert Gates could be anybody. Right. And remember, you growing up, you always hated the brown noser. <laughs> These guys are like high love. They're dangerous. Don't get me wrong. They are dangerous. It's like a little baby rattler. They are dangerous. You don't want to give them any power. Right. All right. So let's move on here. Um, uh, yeah. So then from um, the Ellsberg book, I said, OK, I've got to finally read Ra Raven Rock. I did almost all of it. And I found, I'm not going to go through a, a line by line uh, critique of it. There's a pretty good photo section. Of course, the, the cheap, the paper's cheap as hell. Right? We're the only advanced country that, that produces um, books with, with crappy paper on it. It's disposable. Right? It's not meant for a library, it's not meant for. Anyway, what I'm going to do for you, for my Patreon people, I'm going to scan the pictures, you know, the photos of all the fake atomic bomb explosions, the uh, Harry Truman's White House, you know, all the maps and the civil defense and little fallout shelters that we all grew up. I didn't. My parents didn't believe the BS, you know. Both of my parents, by the way, uh, grew up under martial law in Hawaii. Martial law was declared in 1941. They know what it is. And they also know what it's like being American citizens held to be under suspicion of being enemy aliens. All right. So this is a topic that, that's uh, in my mother's milk, quite literally. Anyway, I'm going to scan this and I'll put it up later, maybe this evening once I have my dinner and uh, relax and cool down and set, settle in to, to, to the evening. And I'll post it so you can um, look at the photos. But, but, you know, buy the book if you want to. But realize it's got its own agenda. And it's an agenda looking to the past instead of the future, which I'll get into in a moment. 
So let, just to kind of uh, give you a glimpse of my argument about these subway systems as being civil defense complexes, let's just take a very brief, fun, relaxing survey <laughs> of these um, uh, underground systems, right? Here's one in... Uh, but I've wrapped my brains on the internet to bring you all the information you need today to get the most out of your ride on what is one of the most amazing systems in the world, the Beijing subway. So to get ourselves into the thick of it and see what it's like, we first need to get ourselves a ticket. Have a look at the map either on an app or online or in the station. Look at where you're going to and the stations that you're going to be changing at. This is the Forbidden City and then you'll see there's two main loops here both of them blue, and they kind of form the main ring road of traffic. And then this is the oldest line one across here. You can buy a transport card like this, which is 40 quid deposit, and you can buy them in the stations too. If you're really tech savvy, you can use your phone, as long as it's AFC enabled. And we'll put the information for that app, the Beijing transport app, in the link below. Today, we're gonna to buy what most people will probably buy on their first trip to Beijing, which is a single use ticket. These ticket machines are really, really easy to use. They come in English. Okay, that's um, a how-to. And these are really useful. If you go to, to uh, before your, your your trip, study these videos very carefully. I, I'm sorry to report, though, that you almost, especially if you're going to China, you uh, almost definitely will have to have a smartphone because almost everything is an app on, on there. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be standing around and trying to figure out what are my ticket it's just easier sorry to say it could be to scan it you know or just have that that ticket he's talking about top it up and then just put it in a little slot and get on the train and go right and do it it's fun and you know what you'll never get lost because you're on the same track <laughs> if you get lost get off at the next station uh crossover either over on the bridge or you go underneath and then get on the other side and then go back, <clears throat> right? And you can just do little by little like that. And if you buy like a, a traveler's, I'm, I'm telling <clears throat> you a lot of travel tips that you don't really need, but you'll learn, you'll learn how to do it. But the point is, this is a <laughs> civil defense co complex. I've been on that one. It's a good one. Nanjing is good. It's a small city, but it's good. Uh, Tokyo is still my favorite. I, I, you know, sorry for my prejudice, but it's the one I know, know the best, but... Uh, and that's just not me uh, saying that. It's a lot of um, professionals as well as travelers. It's confusing as hell to uh, figure it out at first. Uh, but if you're going the same place over and over again, it's, you don't even have to think about it, right? Um, here's another one. This, is in, this one's in Moscow, and um, I haven't been there. I haven't been to Russia. This is a good channel. I forgot her name. She does a lot of travel. She uh, is exploring the Moscow um, underground, which looks to me beautiful. I, I wouldn't even get on the train. I would just walk in, up and down the uh, platform and look at the artwork or in the lobby area. Welcome back to my channel, my name is Alina and today I will show you the underground world of Moscow. Moscow's metro is not only the primary means of transport in the city, but it also represents its culture. Moscow's metro is a tourist attraction itself, so that is why I want to introduce it to you. Follow me to the underground. I talked about prices for public transportation in Moscow and in Russia overall in my other video. The link will be below. Moscow's metro is the busiest metro in Europe and the fifth longest in the world. It has 263 stations, including the on ground stations. It has 12 lines plus monorail plus Moscow Central out of Moscow. Moscow's metro is okay. Welcome back to my I'll, channel. Uh... My name I'll study that one more carefully when I uh, have my trips scheduled for uh, for Moscow. 
you know, when I get my invitation to give a talk at Moscow State University, um, I'll, uh, I'll make my preparations and uh, see what's going on. That, that would be a wonderful opportunity. I, I typically can't go to these places unless it's work related. You know what I mean? That's how you can travel the world by uh, being a poor person. <laughs> Relatively speaking, you get invited to, to go to these places. Um, wonderful places, typically. Just incredible. Location. I mean, that's how I got to Hiroshima. That's how I learned about Japan. I, I got uh, a Fulbright Fellowship, all right? Because I was on that track. You know, they, they wanted me to... I don't know what their... their uh, their grand intentions were, but but they they had me in sort of like the farm team, you know, to like work to prove my worth to them. I, obviously, I failed. So let's take a look. I think this was in um, Seoul, Korea, Gunyam. Remember that guy's name was Sai. Appropriately enough, Gunyam style, a big hit. This is that district in uh, Seoul, which is a, you know, fancy district, you know, money shops and such. But I like these little un no comment uh, body cam type videos, but just give you an idea of how um, how these systems work in the rest of the world. It's civil defense. Because South Korea, as I told you, is occupied about 50,000 troops in the DMZ, some in uh, Busan down in the south. They're all over the place, these military bases, Navy as well, um, uh, Marines. So they're vulnerable. They know that they are expendable. The United States decide, hey, we're going to sacrifice South Korea in the grand chessboard. They know, based on past experience, historical experience, that that's what Britain and the United States will do. They'll sacrifice the chess piece. Here we go. All right, you get the idea. Um, most of these systems are automated so far as paying is concerned. And uh, remember, it's for they're preparing for the big one. Forget about Raven, uh, Raven Rock. Look at these metropolitan transportation nodes as the, um, for you and me, the regular people, right? Dick Cheney and those guys, they're going to have their little rooms in there. Uh, that are being improved now. But even then, they're not going to stay there long. They're, they'll go down uh, to off at Air Force Base, or maybe they'll move them out of the country. They'll move down to New Zealand, and they'll just be having a um, uh, a hologram running running the American government, right? Maybe they'll start doing it full-time, but definitely the election 2024 and any sort of disaster will be holograms. And then probably Joe Biden is... You know, we see him here and there. We, Kissinger is supposedly in Beijing recently. Those might be holograms themselves. They might be reject projections. It's all theater anyway, so might as well go all the way. All right. So uh, this, I think, is the Japanese system in Tokyo, that is. This is New York subway. This is London's. And this is Seoul's. The thing they all have in common is that they're bigger than the subway system in Tokyo. They all have more stations and extend over longer distances. 
But Tokyo is far and away the world's largest city. It dwarfs the others and is now home to more than 37 million people. Beneath these streets is a system that defies convention. It's the world's busiest subway, moving 3.9 billion passengers each year, equivalent to half the world's population, but all in an understated and efficient way. Japan's capital has mastered the art of mass transit, moving more people with fewer lines, fewer stations, and in a smaller area than any other major city. In our opinion, it's the world's best subway. In 1927, Tokyo opened its first subway line. Since then, the network's grown to 13 lines across two interconnected systems that largely work as one. Tokyo Metro has 195 kilometers of track across nine lines with 180 stations and moves 2.7 billion passengers each year. The Toyo subway covers 100. Okay, what the numbers don't tell you is that some of these train lines are one on top of each other so you might have you might go down uh, four or five equivalent stories in, into the earth to, to 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 pick up the line you want so you've got a whole under and you probably got a, a sense of it in the korean subway system but japan the whole subway system is is like an underground city there's restaurants down right off the tracks uh services you know you can get the button replaced on your coat your your uh, high heels hammered back on your shoes whatever you know the uh, luggage repair uh drinks of, of course you know uh, uh hard liquor what, whatever you want it's all there right in fact i had this fantasy of applying for a um, a, a national endowment of the arts uh, grant right just write a proposal to live underground in Tokyo for an entire year without ever coming to the top and just living in the underground system. By the way, uh, Murakami Haruki, the guy who's being positioned as a Nobel laureate of Japan, you know, he's an intelligence asset that was um, housed at Tufts University for a few years. He went back. He's a big darling of all the um, younger readers you know who have, think it's japanese fiction it's murakami right placeless fiction um fiction uh he wrote a book about you know of course the notorious uh om shinrikyo set off their um their bioweapons it's kind of, kind of a test in the panic of the system in uh, the district where there's uh, the national government is it's kasumi gaseki and i've been through there just high rises and also the parliament is in that area. Remember the Om Shinrikyo? Check that one out. Right. Find it on YouTube. Right. So there is an understanding of, of its strategic, at least amongst Om Shinrikyo. And they might be a synthetic organization, probably are, controlled by who knows whom. They're certainly beyond a religious organization, a religious a church. Right. Om religion, Om Shinrikyo. Asahara Shoko, the blind prophet, right? Remember that? Uh, that's what we might remember the, the, the system about. But that's where um, Japanese in these metropolitan areas are going to be, be uh, housed and, and rescued for the next Fukushima or, the, or any type of nuclear war because the government has their own blast sites where, where they're taken care of. Civilians will be down there in Moscow in Seoul, in uh, London, the tube, whatever. In fact, uh, during World War II, during the Blitz, um, that's where a lot of these concepts originated, by the way, of tunneling, you know, continuity of government. A lot of it was inspired by the British experience of aerial bombardment of London. But in World War II, when the sirens went off, the people affected would go down into the tube and They'd bust out the cots and and ride out the uh, the the air raid, right? But like I said, that model doesn't obtain anymore. It's not going to be a conventional boom boom war. It's going to be more like bioweapons labs placed all in these places, 
uh, strategically throughout these different countries and, uh, you know, the respective countries, they could be deployed, right? Because uh, public outrage hasn't really caught up to, to, we still think it was a disease, some kind of a pestilence from heaven that hit us. We, we're still reeling from the shock of it yet, right? Whereas Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we said, oh, a bomb went off. Even if they weren't there, they heard about it. And then they saw the picture and they, they read the John Hersey article about it in the New York, uh, the New Yorker magazine in 1946, which sold out. I'll talk about this next, next Sunday. But the other stuff, if it's presented, you know, what we just experienced as a, as a sickness, an illness, a disease, a pandemic, an epidemic, well, then we don't have anything to worry about because medical science is going to save us. I'm being sarcastic, of course. Check out the uh, bio lab in Fresno after the show. I am. I'm going to start, you know, seeing it if, if, if there's any. That is a huge news revelation. OK, so you get an idea of the civil defense network, primarily in the enemy countries of Asia. And believe me, Japan is still considered an enemy nation. Right. A lot of black boxing fans still think that Japan is the enemy. Right. Because their dads were in the military and they're over there fucking Japanese women uh, during, you know, uh, the occupation in Korea. They were in Korea fucking Korean women. They were in Vietnam fucking uh, North, you know, Korean women. So they own the Asian bitches. Right. So they think the Asian people are weak and, and they have this mind set that and that's just not them. It's all America that they're just going to roll over and die. But I'm showing you they're prepared. They're much more prepared than, than we are because they have been under sustained attacks since, uh, well, probably before what we call World War II. We're talking about from the beginning of the 20th century. I'm including Moscow too, you know, um, uh, as far as that's concerned. Um, okay, so let me conclude because I'm... I'm I was going to try to get it under 90. I'll be lucky if I get it under two. Let me conclude with this final part of oligarchic rule by hologram, holographic control. And I'm saying it's going to start as early as 2024. With all respects to the Trump supporters and to Mike Lindell of my pillow. Right. We're going to be hugging a holographic pillow. There's going to be like, it's, oh, where is it? It's going to look three dimensional, but there's enough, you know, we can poke a hole right through it. You get my point. All right. We're always fighting the last war. We're always fighting a phantom that doesn't exist anymore. I'm not saying it should exist or shouldn't exist. I'm just trying to be real about what's coming down the pie because obviously other countries have been preparing for it and not just other countries, but the United States has been preparing for it. I'll give you some examples about the oligarchic rule by hologram. Uh, you knew about the mass entertainment event, uh, Co um, Coachella. It's not that long, what, 2017, two, something like that. Tupac Shakur, the hologram. You all know about that story. I have a video here if you want to see I don't, don't think I have a time, but you, you take my word for it. You watch. There's a couple on YouTube. By the way, there's some rumors going around that Tupac Shakur is still alive. You know, he was seen joking and horsing around after he was. I don't know. You know, that's just a sidebar right there. Because he was part of a psyops, as, as you know. He even had a, a handler up in Marin County, which is intelligence spook central. It's also the place where Philip Dick went to get to his finishing school before they really rolled on much as a full-time science fiction dystopia man in the high castle, futuristic, fascistic science fiction, quote unquote, total society, valid, fast, fast, active living system, intelligence system, right? Marin County. So um, there was a tribute concert. I didn't know about this until reading this article. I think it was a Rolling Stone. It was a tribute concert to Frank Zappa. And it was done by his family, probably Dweezil, his son, who's an incredible musician and guitarist in his own right, who's been promoting the music of his father, the composition, for the last several years. But I, they now have this, um, this uh, projection, this holographic projection of, of Frank Zappa 
out there and people are paying good money to go see these. So this might be a, a commonplace event. We'll be able to go see, um, you know, Barry Gibbs in Las Vegas in a hologram, right? Or whoever it is, maybe Bobby Darren. We can see him singing Mac the Knife or Somewhere Beyond the Sea with, uh, with Sandra D, his ex-wife. You know, remember that talk that I gave? The sky's the limit. So, you know, the, the, the Hollywood uh, Writers Guild West, they're on strike. That might be the last strike they'll ever have to hold because they're 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 not going to be players and they're not going to have any leverage anymore. So yeah, check those out. There's some other ones, but I'm just giving you some names you might already know. Uh, the show was sold out. Oh, I'm talking about the uh, Zappa with people paying as much as $125 a ticket. Now that's what you pay. For the cheap seats for a live concert, let alone a hologram. As a Roy Orbison hologram tour last year was a financial success, selling 1,800 seats on an average. Oh, this is a moneymaker. I think I'll come up with a line of holographic shirts. You know, it should be like a t shirt with a hologram on it of like, I'll license the images, you know, Marilyn Monroe, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard. Ike Turner, you know, all of it. So, yeah. So there's the whole slate. I won't read you, you know, but there's a whole slate of people, holographic versions. You know, you know who Whitney Houston is. Amy Winehouse, even. She hardly was even on the scene that long. And maybe we, for the last 20 years, we've been watching a hologram called uh, Madonna, right? By the way, did you know she dated uh, Tupac Shakur for 18 months? It's amazing what you learn on this channel. Please subscribe. Please like. Please share. Please support me on Patreon. I am the um, I am the Justin Lin of YouTube. All right, that's my new persona. I'm no longer Shlomo Hamamoto. Right, I am now the Justin Lin of TubeU. <clears throat> All right, so here's serious part is going so okay they did it with the entertainment funzy okay we get to see Tupac Shakur now we got holograms and politics because this is not just my fertile imagination at work here in India they got incredible IT as you know they are right and a lot of the best and brightest came to Silicon DARPA Mossad Valley Pentagon Valley down here not far from where I am Two hours drive, I'll be in Pentagon, uh, Pentagon Valley, right? 140 political rallies at once. India, the second most populated country with 1.2 billion people, has seen how Narendra Modi took advantage of the possibilities the holograms provide his political career. Obsessed with social networks, Modi was named Prime Minister of India after beating Rahul Gandhi in May. So it works. Proof of concept, Right. So I said, okay, that's India. They're ahead of us, you know, so far as tech is concerned. Most of us probably hadn't thought much about holograms since that scene in Star Wars. You know the one. R2-D2 projecting Princess Leia. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Holograms made a brief appearance again in 2012 when rapper Tupac Shakur appeared on stage at the Coachella Music Festival. Come on, yo! 16 years after he died. After Tupac, there was speculation on other uses for the technology, mostly focusing on the entertainment industry, but holograms have now popped up in an unexpected place, Indian politics. <laughs> the Indian election is the biggest on the planet with over 800 million oh, eligible man. voters. So if you're a candidate, how do you reach all of them? In what is believed to be a general election campaign first, Indian Prime Minister hopeful Narendra Modi is using hologram technology to connect with the electorate. Best water treatment Modi's 3D hologram rally allows him to hold 100 rallies simultaneously. Voting finished on May 12th, and it is estimated that Modi will have reached 14 million. Okay. I'm, you're getting sick of the phrase by now, proof of a concept. But then in researching this article, <laughs> I found that they've done it in Turkey. You know, that it, they could do it anywhere because whatever country it is, there is a, a stratum of, of, a, 
a, a tech sector there that can that can pull this. And I'm just saying that this is the model for future world governance through hologram. So that re renders the the um, after the fact um, bemoanings of uh, Daniel Ellsberg and also these uh, supposed revelations about Raven Rock and all these underground uh, fortified uh, cities. It's too little, too late. Okay. So you say India, okay, it's a tech center. We can expect that, but let's see where else uh, they're doing. It. And then we'll wind up with America, right? And I'm saying it's going to, uh, Biden's people are going to do it. And it might be even, what's his name? The guy that looks like Sammy Davis Jr., right? The guy that said, uh, stop the steal, stop the, he keeps going back and forth, whatever, who was ever in power. What's the guy's name again? Black dude? Sometimes he's black and sometimes he's Indian too. He, he's just, he's like Rachel Doziel, whatever's cool at the moment. What's the guy's name again? Not Cash Patel, but you know, anyway, you read it down here in the comment. You know what I'm talking about. He's the guy that would, you know, jumping on, on stage with Alex Jones on January 6th, right? He didn't get arrested. He just disappeared along with Gavin McGinnis and all those other people, the Canadian dude. What's his name? Yeah, he, he appeared out of nowhere. All these characters started appearing right before Jan. I, I said, this is not good. Anyway, so the holograms will have it all under control. Let's check it out. All right. Well, the previous, yeah. the previous piece uh, showed that. Now, let's say it's... Here's an area, and I've been complaining about, uh, about me being the Justin Lin of YouTube. You know, you got Jordan Peterson who's being promoted out there who says nothing. Uh, he makes $8 million a year of U.S. dollars by writing a little uh, moralistic books about how to take control of your life and clean your room. Oh, wise man, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, you you must be, be our guru, right? And here I'm begging you to subscribe to my 11,000 uh, numbered uh, tube you channel. Okay. So I feel like, you know, I feel like Justin Lin, who can't get a contract with the NBA, the National Basketball Administration, not the National Badminton Association. So makes me feel a little bit better that there's a fellow yellow, right? who is pioneering holographic <laughs> electioneering. Uh, he's doing it now. Anyway, here he is. By the way, I don't like, <laughs> don't get the wrong idea. I hate this guy. He's kind of like the, um, the yellow version wannabe of Elon Musk. Up. There's actually two pronunciations of that word that are both fine, like hologram and hologram. They're both fine. <laughs> Just want to let everyone know. Uh, so I'm Andrew Yang. Most of you, raise your hand if you know a whole lot about me, because some of you definitely do. I can tell by what you're wearing. Some of you know a lot about me. I would be very surprised if there's not Andrew Yang hologram campaigning, um, you know, uh, in various parts of the country by the summer. My campaign centered on the fact that technology is transforming our economy and our way of life in, in important fundamental ways. So the hologram is a part of that illustration, but the only way that you can illustrate that effectively is if the technology is truly adding value and solving problems. So if the hologram is there and it's just a gimmick, then it's not actually demonstrating the themes of the campaign. There are uh, two ways you can use the hologram. Um, one is that there's essentially like a three-dimensional recording of you giving a speech. And then the second way you can use it is that uh, if you're in a studio, then you can just take questions and there's like a camera and a microphone in the audience and then if they ask a question, there's just a hologram of me standing there and it, it's, you know, it's like me and then I get the question in real time and I can answer it in real time. Really in, in that way, it would be much closer to the experience of me being in the room uh, because you'd be talking to the hologram as if it were me and then uh, yeah like this and at the end of it I just disappear <laughs> which I think would be interesting and fun for people well there you go he's got he's a tech entrepreneur he's got it all thought out he's gonna he might win just on that basis right uh there's this one he's on the far left right he's the tech left in France who won a seat in, in their part you know equivalent to their parliament uh, and what it what what was the appeal there is that even though he's an older guy, is that oh he's got the young vision because this is what all the um, 
you know, the uh, tech savvy people are into, right? So that's a big selling point for, for someone like a Joe Biden, right? They could make him look a lot younger. Uh, they can fil film them in all kinds of scenarios, right? You name it. And they can do it through the wonders of uh, holography. Anyway, I'm uh, just about out of my time. Thank goodness. <laughs> I don't want to uh, say any more about what I have in store for you next week because um, I don't want to be deleted off of TubeView. And you can believe I have a lot to say about uh, that fateful day of uh, August 6th, 1941, right? 8.05 p.m. Uh, A.M. rather, right, in the morning time. Yeah, their, their, their time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I appreciate you bearing with me. I know I kind of wandered all over the place, but I think I gave you a, a synthesis of where our contemporary politics lies. And at the same time, issuing a warning not to look... Um, in the rear view mirror to old forms of technologies and remedies to this. We're into something new here and we have to anticipate instead of reacting all the time, you know, when being caught in our back foot is reacting. So we have to anticipate this. We might even consider making this a campaign issue. Mr. Biden, President Biden, if you will, uh, or President Trump, because he still addresses President Trump. President, will you pledge to campaign in your God-given body? Right? And if he can't give that pledge, then we can't, we can't support you. Or maybe we can decide as a society that we will support holograms for office. That's for us to decide or have it imposed on us one way or the other. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so good news, no self-annihilation in the immediate future. You're going to go out and enjoy yourself. The bad news is that centralized, authoritarian, globalist rule by holograph or hologram. All right. See you soon. God willing. Bye.